Hey, Guru Nation, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, share. Really means a lot to me that you are watching. And same thing, I'm actually going live on Instagram right now. Uh, we're doing the fundamentals still, and I wanted to think of something I haven't done together. And what better way than to go through a study that we're doing when it comes to patient eligibility patient eligibility one of the most important things in this industry in research if you're running a study whether you're a coordinator a pi or whether you're a cra that's checking this stuff is making sure only qualified candidates get enrolled in the study actually get randomized so that's what the whole screening period is about the screening period in a clinical trial is meant to see if patients qualify. So it's okay if you screen someone and you find out later, hey, they don't actually qualify. That's what a screening visit's for. Now, you can argue, well, you should have done proper pre-screening. I agree. But if you screen someone and they screen fail because they don't meet the inclusion exclusion criteria, you actually did what you're supposed to do. If you were to randomize this person though, now you created major protocol deviation, possibly GCP violation. You're, you're not keeping your oath as far as good, good clinical practice. It's not just the PIs that have a responsibility to patients, it's coordinators as well. You guys and gals all that are study coordinators are doing good clinical practice. You have certificates. If you're a CRA, same thing. It's your job to make sure only the right patients are being enrolled. This is why for new studies, they typically want a CRA to come out to the site as soon as the, pa as the site randomizes their first patient. Like the rules usually two weeks or less from when the site randomized their first patient. Why? Because if the site enrolled someone they weren't supposed to, they don't want to repeat that. They don't want five patients like that. So at least you can catch it, you could retrain the site, most of the criteria that would disqualify a patient lie in the medical history and the concomitant medications. So I really want to focus like on those two aspects because we've done an entire video, I think 30 minutes that we shot with Daniel on randomizations. I want to focus now on where most of the pain points lie with most studies, not all, there are studies where they have weird nuances like patient needed to put X number of, of EPRO entries in the diary and they didn't and then the site still randomized them. Like those are not, those are still bad. Those are deviations, but those are not safety deviations. Generally safety deviations come from medical history and they come from concomitant medications. So. Let's focus on the CONMEDS first, because I think that's the trickiest and probably the one you have the most control over. Most studies, if not all, have very strict these days inclusion exclusion criteria. So I have one, I'm looking in Creo, by the way, shout out to my sponsors, Creo, Versatrel, Viva, and Nato, and brand new One in Health. Thank you guys for making these kind of programs possible. Uh, these studies are not getting easier. Most of the exclusion criteria lies around medications that are not allowed, prohibited meds. I have a study, it's a diabetes study, and they exclude a lot of medication. And it's not just from screening, like you can't be on this med from screening on or from randomization on. There are studies where they do have those criteria. Those are, those are not as difficult. Where sites, the majority of the time get in trouble is the, the fine print in the in inclusion exclusion criteria, generally around classes of medication. So you'll see like GLP-1 inhibitors if you're doing a GLP-1 inhibitor study, they usually don't want patients that have had any 
exposure to any GLP-1 inhibitors in the past, or a DPP-4I inhibitor, or if it's not a diabetes study, if it's a psychiatric study, they may not want any SSRIs within the last three months of screening, or if it's a treatment-resistant study for depression, they want two failed attempts of a antidepressant, and they'll give you the classes, but it's not so simple. Like, you have to actually know the protocol. Sometimes the IE criteria, they're trying to keep a list, and they're trying to keep it clean. So they have footnotes that say refer to table 6.1, refer to appendix J. That's where they'll have the prohibited medications in a chart. And sometimes these charts span like three, four, or five pages. So if that's the case, you got to go to those charts. And these charts, they don't always have the brand names of the drug. They have the generic names. And sometimes they don't even have names. They just have classes. So like I said, the DPP4I inhibitor. Well, if you don't know what that is, you're going to need to go look. And let's, let's be honest. Like, it's supposed to be the PIs doing this stuff. And the PIs know on a surface level, but they're not in the trenches actually screening the patients. They might refer a patient to you. They might have 12 studies they're doing. So they may not remember the nuances of every single inclusion exclusion criteria. So it's the coordinator's job. I just had an interview with a potential intern here. I told her like, it's really thorough, like pre-screening, you really got to go through the inclusion exclusion criteria. And then you've got to go through the, all the tables, the appendices. And if you don't know what a class is, or you don't know what a drug is, I've been doing this 17 years. I'm still Googling on a weekly basis. What is this drug? Let me look at what class, what's the mechanism of action. Sometimes they rule out drugs or they exclude drugs based on the mechanism of action. So sometimes it's, it's even more vague than just a name or a generic name or the uh, actual class. Sometimes it's like mechanism of action that they rule out, which could span a multitude of different drug classes. So this stuff's not simple, guys. And a lot of, a lot of people, like these coordinators, you, these sites think, that okay, I can put like someone inexperienced to be a CRC, but then they end up having problems like deviations for randomizing patients that should have never been randomized. So pay attention to the concomitant meds. I cannot stress that enough. These are super important for you to make sure. And if you're a site director or a site owner, or if you're a coordinator that's very responsible, you will make a cheat sheet for your study where you have already done, you've already done the research and so you can write, like if it's a mechanism of action, you can write in the classes of drugs based on your research and your conversations with your PI and sub-I, what drugs to avoid. And then respect the washout period as well. Some of them say this medication must be stopped from screening on. Others say three months prior to screening they couldn't have been on. Others say six months prior to screening. Others say nine months. Others say never. So you got to pay attention. Now, there's also prohibited meds. So these, what I've discussed for the most part, were the prohibited meds because they interfere in some way either with the efficacy of the study drug or the safety, meaning a contraindication, or it's hard to tell what is doing, what is causing the outcome in that patient, whether it's this concomitant medication or the IP. So the protocol designers thought it was cleaner to just not allow it. So those are like the three main reasons why those drugs are prohibited. It's not to be mean people and not to exclude real world patients. And you can argue that, okay, well, it's cherry picked. And yeah, you can argue like it's not representative of the real world population. That's fine. That's an argument to be had for other podcasts. But I'm telling you on the fundamentals right now, these are the main reasons. Efficacy, safety, or it's hard to tell the outcome, what caused the outcome on the safety or the efficacy. So concomitant medications, really pay attention. Make cheat sheets. Do not ignore the tables. Do not ignore the appendices. 
The next one is the medical history. So oftentimes they, they exclude medical histories, especially if it's like acute or if it's a history of whatever the case may be, all these studies are different. So I have one study where they rule out um, hypothyroidism. Well, not every patient that you're gonna screen has a clean medical history. Sometimes you get referrals, sometimes you get walk-ins, sometimes you get patients that respond to an ad from social media, so you don't have any medical history. So hopefully your site has an intake form where somebody is documenting the medications the patient's taking and then to have proof, you, you ask the patient, can you bring in your prescriptions or your pharmacy records or can we fax your provider uh, to obtain your medical history? If nothing else, at least writing down or whether it's electronically, that's fine, but capturing the medical history that the patients have. Same thing with the medications, by the way, which I forgot to mention in the last one. So medical history is important. Now, sometimes you'll discover medical history during screening that the patient never knew they had. We've discovered, I've discovered HIV before in a patient who never knew they had HIV. You discover hepatitis, you discover nuances, especially with the ECGs, when you do the ECGs of the patients. Um, heart murmurs, you can discover that during a physical. RPI has discovered tons of stuff, even in these two years I've been doing this, during physical exams. Now, not everything you discover during a physical or a blood draw or an ECG is exclusionary. So you need to check with your IE criteria to see, and whenever in doubt, you ask medical monitor. Usually, in most studies, they do not want any medical history that is not any current medical condition that is not stable. So if it's something that's not stable, like if it's newly discovered, let's say hypertension, right? Let's say you keep doing blood, you keep doing vital signs, you keep doing blood pressure and you keep noticing like elevated blood pressure. Well, the patient may not be diagnosed with hypertension, but your PI or sub I or the clinician might say, well, I think this is hypertension. Look at the exclusion criteria. If it says, it may say specifically hypertension, but oftentimes it'll say unstable blood pressure. Now, or unstable medical condition or, un, or uh, untreated medical condition. So blood pressure is a good example because it's somewhat subjective and it allows the PI room to decide clinically for himself or herself whether this is a good fit for the study. So if it's 140 over 85, is that technically that's considered stage one hypertension, but if the patient has not been diagnosed, well, maybe it's something they ate that morning, or maybe they just climbed the flight of stairs, or maybe they just drank some coffee and are a little more amped up or had a monster drink and are a little more amped up. That's the clinician's judgment, NCS or CS. But if they're going to put in their notes, patient not diagnosed with hypertension, during physical, we noted slightly elevated hypertension, PI deems it non-clinically significant, you're good to go. But if the PI says the same thing and says PI deems it clinically significant and due to exclusion criteria number, whatever it is, not a good fit, maybe a candidate to rescreen, or maybe pause the visit and have them come in another day and repeat the vital signs and then ask the medical monitor, hey, what do you think we should do? So these things come up a lot and ignoring them is the worst thing you can do because somebody's gonna catch it. A sharp monitor is gonna catch it and they're gonna question it, especially if they're a CRA that used to be a nurse. Those are some of the best ones because they catch these kind of things. Surgical history is another big one. Um, so these are things you really got to pay attention to. Don't ignore supplements or over-the-counter stuff. A lot of these studies have restrictions for supplements. Coenzyme Q10 is a favorite of supplements that are not allowed. Um, 
so these two areas, medical history and concomitant medications or prior medical medications, you really got to pay attention to. That's really what gets most people randomizing patients that should never have been randomized. So in my particular study, I'm looking at our CREA. We have a study right now. We want a pre-specified medical history checklist. We want prior medications of interest, non-diabetes related, and then we want medications of interest that are related to diabetes, because then we could look at the inclusion exclusion criteria and see. And we also have, like I said, hepatitis screening in this particular study. And we also have a suicide assessment. Now, this is a perfect example. I have a study in the CNS space right now, central nervous system disorders. You can even be excluded off of the diaries the patients do. So when they come in, especially for psychiatric trials, but now increasingly so for everything, it's the patient reported outcomes. So you populate a diary, you give, you, you flip the laptop around to the patient, they do their questionnaires. If you don't pay attention to their responses, you could get an exclusion criteria in there. And it's easy to do because you have like sometimes multiple of these EPROs. And a busy coordinators, while the patient's doing their EPRO, they're doing something else. And they're not always checking their responses. Well, I had one study where they're checking for alcohol use disorder. And we deemed, and the good thing we did it in our notes, the clinician deemed there is no alcohol use disorder. But in one of our surveys, a patient put, they only drink two or three times a month, but when they do, they drink like hardcore. So a lot of the questions they answered, right, and I retrained the staff, were pertaining to like every day. Their responses were like, every day this happens. When in reality, it's only on the days they were drinking, which are two to four times a month. So the score was inflated and made it seem, it actually queried it in the system. This is when the EDC system actually does its job. Hey, this might be a exclusion criteria, but they don't, the systems don't always flag it. So we had to document, write a note. No patient has been retrained on how to do the patient reported outcomes. And I wanted to throw that in there, the patient reported outcomes, because that's going to be increasingly a problem for disqualifying patients. I've also had a similar study in the past. It was a pain study. If the patient, if they don't score a certain uh, number on their patient reported outcomes, their diaries, or if they have an improvement from screening to baseline, you're not supposed to randomize them. Well, if you're literally not counting and doing the math, and again, it's easy to do because you've got a hundred other things you're doing, and there's no automated system to flag it, which most of the time there aren't, you could incorrectly randomize someone. Other times there's little subtle things with ECGs. If the QTRC interval is above 450, should be screen filled. Well, what happens when on your printout of the ECG, it's 448, but then you send it to a central reader and you don't get that result until a few days later, the central reader manually calculates and says, no, it's actually 453, the QTRC. Well, if you're not paying attention, you could randomize a patient when they really shouldn't have. And in that case, that last case, it's out of your control, but I'm just showing you the various ways that that could actually be a problem. So didn't want to make this one too long. Wanted to keep it short. Those are the main ways to get in trouble if you're not paying attention to con meds and if you're not paying attention to pre-existing medical history. And I had to throw in patient reported outcomes. Like, subscribe, comment, share. Guru Nation. Bye-bye.